by the grace of God, we'll be looking at the unchanging world from the beginning, which we have checked the other time. We'll still look at it again. An unchanging world, especially today, an unchanging world for tomorrow. I'll be starting with us with the unchanging world. And I'm going to be looking at tithes and offering. There are things that today, <laughs> they are almost, almost everywhere we go, people ask questions. They'll be asking questions about, okay, why is it? Some people are even saying that people should no longer pay tithes. They should no longer that they are things that God, our Father, had put down for us. Tight and offering. What is tight? Let's start from there. Tight is the 10% of your income, of all your income. Whether they are, I mean, whether they are things from your profits, profit from your business transactions, or your salary or even gifts or gains from investment. So tithe is 10% of it. And we see that it was started by Abraham in Genesis chapter 14 from verse 17 to 20. Abraham was the first person recorded in the Bible who gave tithe. And God expects us to continue in that um, paying tithe. For example, we want to see that it is mandatory, it is obligatory. Some people in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse, we bring money, there is, no, there is no profit. We work, there is no profit. We labor, there is nothing to bring home. God says it's because they have refused to pay their tithes. So tithe is obligatory. Why should we pay tithe? It's very obligatory. It's command from God Almighty himself to all his children, and it belongs to God. According to Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 to 31, Leviticus 27, 30 to 31, tithe, 10% of everything, belongs to God. It's not our own. So we should not eat uh, bile along with our animals. It's like eating bile in an animal. When you kill an animal, no matter how big the animal is, Small bile, you don't want to eat it. You leave it, you throw it away. So tight is like a bile that we must run away from eating. Tight, you want to ask a question, okay, why, what is the use of tight? Tight is strictly for the welfare of the ministers of the gospel. Church workers, church employees, that is what the Bible says it should be used for in, Mal in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It says, bring ye all the tithe so that there will be meat in my house. So tight is for everybody to feed on, for the ministers, I mean, welfare of the ministers and the employees of the church. The another reason why we need to give tight is so that we can be blessed. God himself said, he said, try me with this. If I will not pour out, if I will not open the window and pour a blessing and you will not have enough room to contain it. That is Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. And well, Somebody will now say, what if I don't pay my tithe? Well, you, it, is, it is one reason why you don't want to incur the cost, the wrath of God upon yourself. Because the Bible says, even the ones you bring home, he will blow it away. He will rebuke the devourer for your sake if you pay your tithe. So if you don't pay your tithe, it means that you are the mercy of devourers. May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. Payment of, of tithe is not only in Old Testament. Somebody will now tell me, okay, oh, Pastor, all the ones you have been saying, they are Old Testament. You are referring to Malachi. You are referring to Leviticus. What of in the New Testament? Go study Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Jesus, while you do the little things also, don't forget to pay your tithe. Then that brings us straight to the next thing, which is offering. What is offering? Offering is a kind of gift is what we contribute at Christmas. First Corinthians chapter 16, 
verses 1 and 2. So we must bring offerings to, before the Lord. And of course, in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 38, Nehemiah 10, 38, and Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 25, we must not appear before God empty-handed. That's what the scripture says in Leviticus. We must bring in something, not even only our tithes, but at least, funny enough, in the, in the redeemed Christian church of God, we call it um, love offering. It's an appreciation of God. It's a demonstration of any of your God, our gatherings. You don't want to appear before God empty-handed. You don't want to come and appear like a foolish person. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, it said, give and it shall be given. Press down, shaking together, pressed down and running over shall men bring to your bosom and if you want to take you want to get back then you must learn how to give and it's straight to the next thing which is something similar to that but not exactly and that is what we call first fruit what is first fruit first fruit uh Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 to 10. He said, We must honor God with the increase of our, year, our vineyards. First fruit is bringing, honoring the Lord with the first fruit of our increase. That is the scriptures. So, but this is different from your tithe, it's different from your offerings. So, how do I know what is first fruit? Now, maybe. You've been working in an office with an increase in your salary. The difference between the old salary and the new salary is called first fruit increase. First fruit increase. And I want us to take note of that very well. And then, but if somebody is getting a new salary, you are getting a new job, you want to pay first fruit sacrifice. First fruit sacrifice is the entire for of the new job, or even the entire salary of the new level that you are in. That is called first fruit sacrifice. But first fruit offering is when you net the difference between the old salary and the new one, and you give the difference. That is first fruit offering or first fruit. Yes, first fruit offering. The first fruit sacrifice is exemplified in the book of Genesis chapter 22. Genesis, you can read the entire, entire chapter. When God told Abraham that he should son, he should give his son as that is first fruit sacrifice. And that activity alone is a pointer to the coming of Jesus Christ is a typology we call it typology in, in the Bible college that an example of things that had happened in the Old Testament pointing to so Jesus Christ came and he was he, he, he was killed or sacrificed for us on the cross of Calvary so first fruit sacrifice is an example of that and for Abraham he did not he did not argue with the Lord he offered willingly what he had to God he, had, he offered Isaac and of course that led to not just increase in the blessing that is in, of increase or as God promised It led to irreversible blessings. It led to transgenerational blessings. Generational blessings, even to unborn children. And up to today, the Jews are still benefiting from that singular act of first fruit of sacrifice, what Abraham did. The difference, again, is it, God will respond, of course, if you and there will be increase in your band, while that of sacrifice leads to transgenerational blessings. Now, another thing about false fruit is that male children are supposed to be redeemed 
every male child, according to Exodus chapter 30, verse 30, Exodus 30, verse 30, God says they, are, they belong to him. They're supposed to be redeemed. Oh, you want to say, Pastor, will I kill my first child, my first male child? No, that's not so. You know, but you can bring an offering, an, an amount of money, and give to the high priest, to the chief priest of your church. Now, in the redeemed Christian church of God, you want to ask me, who is the chief priest? It's not your parish pastor. It's not just provincial pastor. It's not even your zonal pastor. It's not your regional pastor. The chief priest in the redeemed Christian church of God is the general overseer. So you put something, an amount of money that you can afford, not necessarily a certain amount. That, okay, you say everybody must bring one, one million naira for a child. No. But what you can afford, bring it for the chief priest. And it is a way of dedicating this child to the Lord. Because I must tell you, the devil... The devil is interested, and I pray that he will not get your own first child in Jesus. He will not get any of your children in Jesus' name. That you will have peace concerning your children. What are the benefits of first fruits? From what we've just said, like in example of Abraham, Father Abraham, God will command his blessing according to Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. He, will, he, he has promised, and he will keep his promises. God will mightily bless you. If you go study Genesis 24, from verse 35 to 36, Genesis 24, 35 to 36, Abraham's servant confessed. He said, God has greatly blessed my Lord, my master. Cows, he asked, plenty of servants, men servants and maid servants. He had a store of them. I like the way the scripture puts it. He said he had a store of servants. Can you imagine that? And also, Hannah gave Samuel to God. And what happened after that? The Bible says, according to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 21, he ha she had five more children, three boys and two girls, apart from Samuel. So God honored, God honored her faith and blessed her with more children. What about Solomon? Solomon that gave burnt offering, a thousand burnt offering to the Lord at the beginning of his regime. That is a symbolic first offering in its way, first fruit offering. And God blessed him with wisdom, with riches that is beyond description. According to 1 Kings chapter 3 from verse 3, to 14. First fruit of every type is what God asks from his children, and this is a way of declaring our love for him. To pay our first fruit is to establish more firmly his covenant with us, the covenant of prosperity. God has promised that he will bless us in everything that we lay our hands upon. I tell you tr the truth. If we pay our tithes, we pay our offerings, we pay our first fruit offerings also, some of the financial battles that we pass through, God himself would have dealt with them. There are classical examples in the life of people around us. There are testimonies of the faithfulness of God concerning finances that if some of us start sharing, you will think God is partial. But God is not partial. You pay your tithe. God would die. Uh, have you seen people who, who two people will in, invest in something and one will prosper and the other one will not prosper? They are both children of God. Why? You are God says, Whatever you lay your hands upon, you will prosper. How come somebody is prospering and the other one is not? Go and check it. It may be that somebody is not paying his tithe. So paying tithe, some of us think we know we know mathematics more than God. We, we, we are better in arithmetic than God. Then we begin to see people asking questions. Is it gross or net? <laughs> when you see people asking that kind of a question, you need to ask them, how much is your actual salary? Your salary is 100000 but you have deducted that one from source. You have, uh, you are, you are contributing for your 
cooperative society, another 10,000 Naira. So you are left with only 40,000 Naira. How much is your salary? Sir, don't deceive God and don't deceive yourself. Your salary is still 100,000 Naira. So pay, because the one you collected, did you, where you took the loan, did you pay title of, of that loan? No, definitely no. And are you sure you will pay tithe of the cooperatives society contribution that you will collect maybe in 20 years' time? So let's not place my to overdo it than to underdo it and incur the wrath of God. May God continue to bless us in Jesus' name. I want to go now to start talking about the second coming of Christ. That's the next thing we want to talk about. Now, this is very, very important because what is happening around us today, COVID-19 and co, some people will say, oh, 5G is a way of uh, introducing the mark of the beast, 666. Some will say, no, it is true. Very really clear about this thing. The Antichrist will not sneak in. No, not at all. He will not sneak in. He will come fully and he will come complete. So he will not, he will not uh, sneak in. Yes, truth must be told that the preparations for the Antichrist, they are part of the preparations for the second coming of Christ. But it is not that, okay, today they will sneak it in. Whether it's RFID, whether it's 5G, for your information, 6G is already being made. So we are still arguing about 5G. We are already, the, techni the technology world is already in 6G. I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So what about the second coming of Christ? The second coming of Christ will be in two parts. The first part, well, maybe in Acts of Apostles chapter 1, talking with the disciples. And then they ask him, tell us now, what will be the sign of your coming? Is it now? Then Jesus told them. He said, look, it is not yet time. And as he was talking, the Bible says they were looking at him and he ascended to heaven. As they were gazing into the sky, then they saw two men who now told them, men of Galilee, why gaze you into the sky? This same Jesus, he will come in the same way as you have seen him. That is the same way that he will return, according to Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. So we must notice one thing, that Jesus Christ is going to come. He said in John chapter 14, he said, I go prepare a place for you. And when I go, I will come back. I will come back. And when I come, I will take you so that, to where I am, so that where I am, you also can be there. So, second coming of Christ is going to be in two parts. The first part is what we, the Bible described as coming for the saints. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 and 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 and 17. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we will are alive and remain. Be with him. First Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. First Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. And also in Revelation 19, 7 to 9. So from these scriptures, we notice Jesus Christ will come, and then there will be trumpet that will be blown. When the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ will hear. And then those who are alive and remain, excuse me, remain where? Remain in the Lord. Not all the people that, are remain, that remain alive will, will go. It is only those who remain in the Lord that will hear the trumpet and will go with Jesus and we will be with him in the sky. Now, that is in the sky. For how long will that be? That will be for a period of seven years. It is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. That will be happening there, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 
we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That is what will be happening there. Believers will be judged according to their works. They will receive rewards for what they have done. For that period of seven years, it will be a honeymoon because our husband would have come to take us. And I pray that at that marriage supper of the Lamb, you will not be missing in Jesus' name. You and I will partake of it in the mighty name of Jesus. While that is happening in the sky, some things will be happening here on this earth. It is called the Battle of Armageddon. Preparation for the battle will be going on. Well, that will happen not immediately. After the, four, the, the, the seven years will be divided into two, three and a half years, especially for those who, are, who remain on earth. The first aspect of it, there will be John. Now, everything, this peace that the United Nations is trying to, to seek, I tell you, until Christ comes, that peace will not be available. Go and study Matthew chapter 24 again, from verse 14. In fact, start, read the entire chapter 24 of the book of Matthew. Prepare us very well for this, that there will be war, there will be rumors of war, there will be pestilence. So, Corona virus or this COVID-19 is part of the pestilence. But the truth is God himself promised that he will protect his own children. So while in the first three and a half years there will be peace, relative peace, let me call it. While that is happening, then the believers are in heaven. So at the second half of it, Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, the temple will be rebuilt. And at the dedication of that temple, then the Antichrist will reveal himself, that, he, that they should worship him. That is when the Jews will say, no, you are not our Messiah. We cannot worship you. You are a human being. It's according to Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 to 16. Revelation 16, 13 to 16, and Revelation 19. Verses 11 to 22, Revelations 19, 11 to 22, is what is referred to as the battle of the Gog and Magog. Well, we call it the battle of the Armageddon. And all, the Antichrist will mobilize the, what we call allied forces with the sole aim of exterminating the children of Israel. It is at that point that the second phase of the second coming of Christ will be fulfilled which is that Jesus will now return with his saints to this earth. Second, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10. And also in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, that the Bible says that we are priests and kings, from verse 5. So when that happens, the battle of Armageddon will be fought, and Jesus Christ will win that battle from Revelation chapter 20 downwards, verse 1 downwards. He will win that battle just by the breath of his nostrils. By the breath of his nostrils. That is when he will win that battle. That will lead to another period that is called the period of uh, 1,000 years period of millennial reign. In the period of the seven years, what will be happening here or not is what we call the Great Tribulation. While the marriage supper of the Lamb is going on in the sky with Christ, the, what will be happening here is called Tribulation. And in that period of Tribulation, if you study my Revelation 19 very well, it will be difficult for people to buy and to sell without the mark of the beast. So when people are saying that, oh, they are introducing 666. Now, my take is this. Jesus has not come. If Jesus had not come, the Antichrist will not introduce the 666. He may be, they may be testing anything now. For your information, do you know that telephone has gone beyond this handset that we carry about? We don't, very soon, technology has gone beyond just the use of handset that with just a small implant of uh, something very small, we call it RFID, into your body, you can, with a swing like this, your telephone will ring. So a lot of things through the use of what we call artificial intelligence, through the use of robots, so many things are happening today that 
Technology is preparing for the Antichrist. You and I know too well, before year 2000, there was But today we have ATM. Before, 10 years ago, or by 10 years ago, there was nothing like BVN. So you and I can have 10, 4, 20 different accounts. Nobody will know. You can use different names. Nobody will link them to you. But today, if you like, have 100 accounts. So long as it is with the same BVN, somebody is, is sitting before one computer and he sees all you. It, it sees what you're doing. So we're actually preparing for the Antichrist, even in Nigeria. What about television programs? Before, when we gave our lives to Christ, they told us that, oh, when somebody is talking somewhere, we will see him online, real life. Real life. Or we will see, they say, as he's talking in America, we will be seeing them. We, then it was difficult for us to believe because television in Nigeria used to open at 4 o'clock and close by 11.15 after the news cap. But today, television is in your hand. You, you are playing football somewhere in Real Madrid. You are watching it on your phone. Everything is now. And they need internet that is faster and more robust. And so all these things are happening. They are preparations for the second coming of Christ. So the time between the second coming, or between the, when Jesus Christ received his brides or the saints to heaven, and the second time that he is coming to rule with the saints on this earth, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, and Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, Revelations chapter 9, chapter, and chapter 16. There are so many scriptures that we can read for all this, and especially Revelations 3, 10 also. To receive the saints to heaven, and he's coming back. That, is, that period is called the period of great tribulation, which will culminate in persecution of the saints and the gathering together of the allied forces to fight the battle that is called the battle of Armageddon. My prayer is that we will not partake that in that battle in Jesus' name, that we would have gone with Christ in heaven so that we, if at all we are going to partake, we are going to join Christ uh, and, his, and we will be on horses, white horses, returning with Jesus Christ so that we can fight the, against the kingdom of darkness. Of course, it is that one that will lead to the beginning of what is called millennial reign. 1,000 years of peace on earth. That is when that name of Jesus Christ, that he is indeed the Prince of Peace, that is when it will be fulfilled. Then everybody, there will be peace unprecedented in this earth by that time. 